Hey, grab a seat, everyone. Thank you, worship team. So beautiful. So good to sing and declare together, right? Oh, one of my favorite things about Sunday is just to come and just to worship and, and, and do that together. You know, I, I think um, yeah, we're so blessed to be able to do that. And so now I'm just going to invite um, Jess. She's going to come and yeah, she's going to introduce to us uh, the sermon series that we've been trucking along. I think this is week five. Who's been enjoying the, uh, the By Faith series? It's been good, hasn't it? So um, here we go again. For those of you who've missed this or you're brand new, um, thank you, Jess. Take it away. Cool. So today we continue our series entitled By Faith. This series has its roots firmly established in chapter 11 of Hebrews. This great chapter is a salute to the heroes of our faith, and in it we see their highlight reels being showcased. We see God commending them for their faith that they have held in their hearts and the faith that tr they trusted to drive them into action. Hebrews 11 and verse 1 reads, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. And this description of faith is an inward attitude, an inward conviction about what is not necessarily present, but that which we confidently expect to transpire. Having faith is being sure and certain about what is unseen. So throughout this series, our prayer is that we would all be inspired together as a church to live our lives walking by faith and not by sight. Those who have gone before us have paved the way, so let's follow in their footsteps and by faith fulfill all that God has for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Give her a round of applause, eh? Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, Hebrews 11, it's, um, there's, man, there's some weight, there's some meat within just this chapter. There's, there's so many narratives that are just, uh, you know, talked about and, and as you begin to unpack it like we've been doing over the last five weeks there's been an incredible uh, amount that we can just draw on and, and gleam from and, and um, so today is going to be no different so I, I hope this morning you're ready to respond by faith you guys feeling like that yeah yeah oh, that was actually a rhetorical question I hope this morning you are prepared to respond by faith and, and get excited this morning see we're going to be looking at one of the heavy hitters one of the heavy hitters of the faith uh, this morning, and, and that's going to be um, Noah. So come with me this morning, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, and we're going to start and, and kind of use this as a foundational stone, this, this one verse, and, and we're going to kind of refer back to it every now and then and, and uh, just kind of let this text kind of come alive to us this morning as we, as we lean into Noah. So Hebrews 11, verse 7, by faith... Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, what did he do? He built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is keeping with faith. All right, so this is our starting block, and this is where we're going to launch from. But uh, I want to start and say, hey, Noah, he had a tremendous life, didn't he? He had a tremendous life of faith. And, and uh, I tell you what, uh, he, he became the second father to humanity, um, Adam being the first, as we, as we know. God created uh, man in his own image, and, and as, as the story of Noah kind of goes about, we, we know that he becomes that second father of, of, uh, of humanity, and God established a new era or a new day through Noah, didn't he? Uh, and in fact, he, he sealed his covenant with the beauty of a rainbow. Who loves a, a good rainbow? Honestly, it's good. Eh? Hey, can I just have a second now, just to, or a minute, or just a moment to try and claim the rainbow back? Because I feel like we've we've lost the rainbow a little bit, or we've lost some traction with it. So, so give me a moment for a second. Have a listen to this: an arc of translucent washes of color, soft yet bold, a gift from above. Seven colors seamlessly woven together, hovering in ease, the majestic and majestic grace. Ordered and splendid, yet in random perfection, refracted and wild, a work beyond measure. They pierce the dreary and the gloominess of day, sealing God's covenant with humanity, gracious and grand. His redemptive plan artistically illustrated, every time one is witnessed, be reminded and lifted. 
A little bit of poetry there. I try to leave, lean into my, my grandma, um, who, who was someone who just loved to write poetry. But do you know what I love about rainbows, other than the fact of their sheer beauty and the description that I've just brought? Rainbows are incredible. They've got an ability to stop people in the street. When you see a rainbow, like it's got this, this power, this ability to, to stop whoever it would be. And, and people stop, and what do they do? They look heavenward. They look up and they're like, often there's like, whoa, check out that rainbow. Um, sometimes there's photos and phones coming out taking, taking pics and, and a rainbow has this incredible ability to do that, doesn't it? And I think that's an amazing thing. You see, the rainbow is a glimpse of God's wonder and his awe. It's a fulfillment of his word. But even more, it's a promise of so much more to come. Hallelujah. So I just want to say from the get-go, thank the Lord for his promises. Thank the Lord for the rainbow. Thank the Lord for the faithfulness of Noah. The, the rainbow, I love it. It's good, eh? So hopefully that's a little bit of trying to claim that back this morning, um, trying to get us to, to focus in on, on uh, that, the kind of the roots of the rainbow. Anyway, Noah, who's excited to hear it from Noah this morning? Yeah, from his life. Like I say, a heavy hitter. Um, if you were going to compare him to um, maybe some of the heavyweight boxers around, maybe, you know, um, I don't know, maybe Mike Tyson, but, um, but without the aggression of biting people's ears off, you know, like he had, a, he had a seriously a good punch. Maybe if we were trying to bring it a bit more local, David Tua maybe, a um, very heavy hitter um, and, and a good, you know, man of faith as well to a degree. So anyways, Noah, what does his name mean? Does anyone know what Noah's name means? Rest. Oh, that's good. It is right. By nature, Noah's name it actually forecasts salvation. And what do I mean by that? Well, Noah meaning rest, well, it, it, it pointed. And, and what did it do? It forecasted the Lord's plan of salvation through the flood. You see, Noah and his family, they were living in, in, a, you know, in a time of astonishing wickedness. There was an incredible amount of corruption and, and whatnot going on around them. See, the flood, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was the saving of his family. Uh, that came, and, and, and it came as a, a miraculous season of rest. You see, rest from the chaos and the wickedness. And, and I don't know, whenever I read Scripture, and I know if you've been you know, in this church for a while and you've heard me preach a lot, I always try to put myself in the text or try to you know, bring it to life. And, and, and what would it have been like for Noah to be living in that time, you know, f- just surrounded by the wickedness, surrounded by the corruption? It must have been exhausting. It must have been tiring. It must have been extremely hard. So Noah's name meaning rest, that's exactly what God did through Noah you know, he, he was able to lead him and his family to a, a new season, a new era, a, a season of rest. So secondly, I want to say his name points and it forecasts to Jesus. And if you're with us at the combined service, John Tucker, he, he, he pulled out a, a beautiful verse, Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 28. And, and have a listen to this. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I, Jesus... I will give you rest. See, Noah's name even forecasts towards Christ. I love this. What about Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And, and hear this bit. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want to say the peace of God is rest to our entire body. And when I say like our entire being, every part of us, God's peace is rest to us. And, and so I hope you've experienced that this morning in our worship. I hope you've had a, a moment to just be able to bask in that rest and that peace and, and, and God's goodness and his victory, because that's what we, that's what we get as we, as we just lean in and, and that just kind of comes upon us. And that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I absolutely love it. So, so what? What is this verse in Philippians? It's, it's saying, oh, and even in Matthew, it's saying, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about the times we're living in. Don't be anxious about what tomorrow what might bring, but instead come to Jesus. And, and what will he do? He will grant you peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. Guarding your hearts. Guarding your minds. Giving you rest. Amen. 
So Noah forecasting salvation. Noah forecasting Jesus leading you know, him and his family and, and, and a picture of Christ leading us into rest. Hallelujah. So the story of Noah, I love it. It's got so many complexities, so many things. We can, we can read extremely deep or we can just view it as kind of a, an overall kind of picture. I hate to use the word shallowly, but you know, we, can, we can look at it and there's, there's so much to it this morning. We're not going to be able to cover it all, but, but I want to say that did you realize there was two floods in Noah's day? Not just one, but there was two floods. First, there was a flood of wickedness, and then there was the flood waters of judgment that came. So two floods. And so let's have a little bit of a read. If, if you're brand new, you don't know the story of Noah, we'll, we'll, we'll pick a little bit out of the text, and, and we'll kind of bring a little bit of um, you know, clarity to where we're going. And for those of you who just want to be reminded, um, come with me this morning. So we're going to Genesis chapter 6. And we'll start in verse 5, and, and we'll read a little bit here. So, so come along the journey. Here we are. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart were only evil all the time. I mean, that's pretty full on. That's an, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to, um, you know, get good at preaching and, and, and you're just kind of starting out, like probably don't read this verse. Um, it kind of puts people on a back foot. Like don't, don't dive into this one first. But, um, you, know, uh, you know, you've got to, oh, come, come with me, continue to read. This is insane times, this, this intense evilness that, that God was just grieved. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. You see what I'm saying? This is, it kind of brings us down a little bit, doesn't it? But, but keep coming. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals and the birds and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. I mean, these are heavy, strong words. But, verse 8, hallelujah, but Noah found favor in the Lord. And we leaned into a little bit of this word favor last week with Cain and Abel, didn't we? And, and so you're going to see it come up a little bit more here today. Continuing verse 9, this is the account of Noah and his family. You see, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. He walked faithfully with God. And Noah, he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. And God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God, what did he do? God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is full of violence, full of violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. And, and so this is the story that, that continues to... to to lead into the, the narrative of his life. And, and it goes on to say that, that Noah was to, to build an ark in, in certain sizes and, and dimensions. And, and uh, you know, this was the layout. He, he gave him a real clear direction on how to do it. And it goes on to say that two of every living animal, as we know, will, will, will come to him, male and female, and, and he'll be able to put them inside the ark. God is going to send this great flood or the flood waters, and, and it's going to cover the entire earth, destroying all life. But he will establish his covenant with Noah and save him and his family and the animals inside the ark. So this, that, that's the story in a nutshell, and, and we know that that's exactly what happened. And I just want to jump down because there's this very cool couple of verses here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22. And it says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And if we weren't in this, you know, by faith series, we'd probably, this is a whole sermon right here, and I'd probably call it just as. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. You see, the, the details matter to God, I want to say that. You know, he, he, wouldn't have, he wouldn't have given the details if they didn't matter, eh? See, uh, there's this, this sense of, of God has instructed us, he's given us the Bible, and, and we need to follow that. And, and for some of you here this morning, just hearing that word, just as, is actually the word that God wants to speak to you this morning, I honestly believe. You know, you're, you've, been, you've been trying to kind of keep going or, or, or keep walking, or, you know, maybe you've, you've had God spoken to you in the past, but you've, you've kind of just 
continue to kind of find your own way through, but I just want to say, go back to the beginning. Go back and, and realize that, that God's just saying, hey, just, just, just as, just follow the commands, just as I've told you. Just read the scripture. Trust in me, just as. And, and yeah, I mean, that's a, a, a sermon that we could absolutely preach, but I, I don't want to go there this morning. But hear this, Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. This next verse, chapter 7, verse 1, the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. I like that last little bit. Can we, maybe can we repeat that together? Uh, what, what is it? I have found you righteous in this generation. Can we repeat that? Come on. I have found you righteous in this generation. Because as we read these stories, eh, we should always be applying them to ourselves. And, and, and so, hey, are, are we being found righteous in this generation? You see, Noah and his family, they were the only ones who remembered God. They were the only ones who were loyal to him. The rest were an absolute mess. It was, it was carnage. It was, it was a nightmare. But Noah and his family, they were the only followers of God. God regretted that he made humans. Like, this is, this is heavy. This is, you know, that's how bad it was. It was, it was an intense situation. And, but Noah found favor in God's eyes. I love this. And so last week, you remember Abel, the Lord looked upon Abel with favor, looked upon him and his sacrifice with favor. On Cain, he, he didn't. I want to say for us, because of Jesus, because of Jesus Christ, God looks at us with favor. You know, it's like that lens or that filter as God looks through Christ, he sees us in full righteousness, forgiven, whole. He sees us as blessed, as called, as healed, as whole, like what we were singing about this morning, you know. So, so we have that. But I want to say, does he find favor in your actions and your offerings? You see, it's grace that, we, that, we, that God looks at us with favor. But what are we doing with that grace? Grace isn't a free pass, but grace actually insists us to go a call to action. So does, does he find favor in our actions and our, and our offerings? And So come on, let's jump back to Hebrews 11 and, and, and keep looking at this verse 7. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, and, and what were they? That was the coming judgment. That was the coming floodwaters. And, and what did he do? He responded. He responded in holy fear and built an ark to save his family. So by faith, Noah, believing God's warning, believing about the judgment that was coming, he responded reverently, didn't he? He responded to God in deep respect. He responded to God in, in awe and in holy fear. You know, he didn't respond to God in contempt like what we saw with, with Cain last week. But no, he, it, was, it was this holy fear. He responded by faith. And, and so we, we get to this, this challenging question is, is, how are we responding to God? How are we living our lives? How are we responding to him? You see, when God speaks to us or when he challenges us, when he warns us, maybe when he disciplines us, maybe when he just calls you a little bit closer, come, come a little bit closer. Are we responding with respect or are we responding with contempt? And I know this is a, a challenging word. It's easy to fall, I think, into this, this thought process of like, yeah, I am responding with respect. I am responding with faith. But when my actions and my obedience paint a different story, suddenly I think we, we slip into the contempt uh, you know, category a little bit way, way too easy. For Noah, think about his scenario. Think about the word that God had spoken to him and the way in which he was going to respond to the call that, that God had put on his life. In his natural eyes, what did, he, what did he see? What did he do? God's command, his instruction, it seemed absolutely crazy. And it, it seemed absolutely foolish even, for it had not yet even rained on the earth. But Scripture tell us, tells us, say, hey, to walk by faith, not by sight. And... and, and and so, man, thank goodness for Noah who, who, who obeyed. It took him 120 years of obedience to complete the task that God put upon him. 
I want to say not because he procrastinated, not because he was slow, not because, you know, he was unmotivated or whatever. No, it was simply because of the magnitude of the task that God had put on him. 120 years. You see, for, for Noah, faith, it, it contained, what did it contain? Commitment, consistency, patience, obedience. All of that stuff doesn't come naturally, does it? I, I don't know if there's too many people out there who, are, who could list those four things off and just say, oh, they just, they just flow supernaturally in my life. You know, patience, commitment, consistency, obedience. You've got to work at them, eh? And we're not told what Noah's character is like. Um, Noah's, it kind of comes off as quite a soft but strong name, one that's going to bring rest, as we know, but we're not told. Either way, I want to say that Noah would have had to work at it. Noah would have had to kind of graft at it. So how's your patience? How's your commitment? How's your consistency and, and your obedience looking? You know, we too have to work at it. But thank the Lord we've got the Holy Spirit with us, eh? To, to guide us and lead us into to that type of stuff. And so it's good. You see, obedience is a long-term commitment, isn't it? It's a long-term commitment, and God is faithful to those who obey. And so when I started thinking about a long-term commitment and, and what's a good example of that, I, I, you know, I suddenly thought about um, my marriage, my, my relationship with Jess. And, and so for me, it all started uh, when I went to shop at Manukau Mall and, and found a beautiful diamond ring that I was going to give her and, and um, you know, it cost a lot of money, opened my wallet and I think that's where the commitment started. When the, when the wallet opens up, hey, girls, you know you've got the man when his, when his wallet opens up. Um, but, uh, you know, from there I sort of planned a, um, a nice little picnic at Slipper Island and hijacked the jet ski off my brother and, um, yeah, went it from Pawanui across the bar and out to Slipper Island, had a lovely picnic on the beach there and, and um, finally got down on one knee to, to propose and um, she turned around and saw me and, and um, I, I love telling this story because she said, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you and then tried to kick me um, because apparently I'd been lying to her all day that I'd been misleading her um, but of course she said yes but um, yeah, crazy story. I, I wasn't quite sure what she was doing. I, I was, am I getting up? Am I running? Um, does she want? Yeah. Um, but then, you know, as, as time went on, we, we ended up getting married in this church and, and um, you know, special significance, I guess. But I remember her coming through the double doors at the back and, and I just couldn't wipe that smile off my face. And, and you know, that commitment started as, as we put those rings on our fingers. And, and you know, that's this, it's a long-term commitment, isn't it? My mum and dad, 52 years, um, you know, wedding anniversary, that's, that's a huge effort. It's a, it's a life sentence, like my dad jokingly said, but... Um, but it's a commitment, a long-term commitment. And, and I don't think we actually live our Christian relationship thinking about like a long-term commitment like that. I don't think we view Christ like that. But man, we absolutely need to. We absolutely need to. Going through the ups and the downs together. Being there. Sleeping next to each other. You know, laughing and joking you know, frustrated and, and, oh, and angry at times, but, but just, you know, those intimate moments, those incredible fun moments, like th that's how we need to view our relationship. I don't think we do often. I don't think we view our walk with God as, as someone right there beside us. And, and so that kind of messes us up as Christians. That's how the text, that's how I read it. That's how a relationship should be with, with Christ. And if you've had a bad experience in marriage, I know that makes it hard to kind of, um, you know, compute or, or, or compare it up, but, but uh, you know, that's, for me, uh, you know, obedience is a long-term commitment, but the beautiful thing is God is faithful to those who are obedient. So back to Noah, thinking about him building the ark, you know, thinking about you know, what would have been going on? I mean, he would have been the talk of the town, wouldn't he? There would have been some serious um, accusations. There would have been some serious, you know, words getting slung at him. Um, I can imagine there would have, it would have been not an easy task, being the only one who was faithful, the only one who was stepping out and, and following the Lord. So, yeah, definitely the talk of the town. I reckon in today's day and age, 
you know, on most, most certainly, I reckon people would have jumped the fence, gone up and been spray painting, tagging on his ark, and like mocking him, and, and, and you're ridiculing him, and like throwing stones at him, and, and I reckon it would have been, um, you know, this day and age. Imagine what the social media would have looked like. The Thames grapevine, you know, there would have been people taking photos of the ark and like, what is this guy up to? Um, I, I want, I'm not smart enough to think of any jokes off the fly, but you can imagine, it, there would have been stuff getting slung left, right, and center. The threads would have just been running hot on, on Facebook, but imagine it. But by faith, what did he do? He held strong, didn't he? I'm sure there would have been some tough days like any good old marriage as well. But I'm sure there must have been some tough weeks, even tough years. For crying out loud, this was was action and obedience for 120 years. That's longer than our lifespan. No wonder he made it into the Hall of Faith, eh? What a man. I I told you, a heavy hitter. That that, that commitment, that determination, that patience to, to continue despite everyone around him. Big stuff. So as we compare our day and our age, you know, with that of Noah's day, we, we see a, a, a great flood of violence, of wickedness kind of beginning to rise up around us, don't we? We only have to watch the news. We only have to read the newspaper. We only have to see kind of what's going on. See, our laws and our morals are just kind of migrating further and further away from God. And it's sad and it's frustrating and, and sometimes as Christians we don't know how to act and how to respond and stuff stirs up inside of us and sometimes we make a mess of trying to you know, stand for the Lord and, and for His principles and we actually you know, do a bad job of it, but, but we've, got to, we've got to be spirit-led in how we respond. But yes, it's sad. Yes, it's frustrating. But you see, our beliefs in Christ are, are being viewed more and more as different, as old-fashioned as, as, you know, out of date, and then this is putting it politely, people will think that, that having a, a belief in Christ is strange, even foolish. So, so we know what comes with that, doesn't it? Because, don't we? Because we, we walk in that journey at the moment. There's pressure, there's tension about the way we live our lives in comparative to, to how others do. You know, sometimes it can turn even into hostility and, and not so much in, in, in Thames in New Zealand here, but persecution begins to rise. But think about it, the generations during the last 150 years in our nation, they've never had this level of stigma towards Christianity, have they? Our nation, in a sense, in, in, in recent history, we know it was established on the, on the gospel, and, and, and our laws and our government are all built around that, but slowly but surely, we've migrated and moved away from that. So there's a real stigma and tension. But I want to say a positive way of looking at it, I believe, is this. As the darkness gets darker, our light gets brighter. And that's Christ within us. And, and so for me, that's been a scripture or, or a concept that I've continued to hold on to in recent times is, yeah, yeah, there's chaos out there. Thinking of Noah's day, complete wickedness. God was so frustrated, he, he regretted he even created man. Imagine what it was like for Noah. So for us, I, I just think, okay, as the darkness gets darker around us, thank the Lord that our light will get brighter. Hallelujah. Our obedience to Christ and his ways, it makes the world's disobedience stand out, doesn't it? More and more. The world doesn't always like it when you know, when they, they look upon a Christian or a church or an organization and, and, and there's, there's obedience towards Christ and, and it, it just causes the filth or the, the, the darkness in their life to stand out and, and often there's some kickback with that. You see, Noah's obedience, Noah's faith that condemned the world and that's what we see in, in Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith, he condemned the world and and, you know, as we read the stories of Noah and, and, or the story of Noah and, and look at some, maybe some of the commentaries or begin to study, a lot of them would say that Noah was a preacher, one who, who went out and declared the judgment or the coming judgment, a bit like a prophet. I, I honestly think he didn't have time to do that. I wonder if rather it was more his obedience or his action, his commitment, his faith, you know, over that 120 years of building that ark, that that's what actually condemned the world. 
And often we think that preaching has to be something that's standing up the front here, but actually it's our action and our lifestyle. Our lifestyle speaks louder than we know. Our righteous conduct is a witness to the world. And you see, one of my roles is, as, as a pastor or your pastor is to encourage you in your righteous conduct, to, con- to encourage you in your right lifestyle, you know, to help make sure that it's being passed on to the next generation. I talked about that, that baton, that torch, passing it on, illuminating the darkness. See, let's look at the last part of Hebrews eleven seven. 7. What does it say? Noah became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with the faith. That baton or that torch, it was, it was passed down to Noah, wasn't it? And in each generation, it's passed down to, to keep that flame burning. And, and each generation wrestles and, and struggles with the challenges of life. But, but that is, you know, in a nutshell, in a, in a way of looking at it, uh, a torch being handed down. So our role as Christians is to run, to run with that torch. Like I said, illuminating the darkness passing it on to the next generation. So as we kind of, kind of wrestling with Noah here and, and looking at it, there's, there's so much in his life that we could look at and, and we're, we're quickly running out of time this morning and I don't want to drag us on for another 45 minutes as we kind of look at all the details. But, you know, there's one aspect of, of, of this, this judgment through the floodwaters that foreshadows the final judgment uh, of Christ's second return at the end of the age. And, and we need to be found ready and, and waiting as Noah, you know, was obedient for 120 years, prepared himself, got his family ready, built the ark, was obedient. And, and so we need to be doing that by faith, ready and waiting. But the final point that I want to bring out today is this. You see, Noah was moved by godly fear. He responded by faith, didn't he? And real faith, it it calls us to action, doesn't it? Real faith gets us moving, doing God's will. So he responded by faith, and and have a listen to this. He prepared the ark for the saving of his family. And there's, there's so much significance in that little phrase. He responded by faith, preparing or prepared the ark for the saving of his family. See, God desires that you and me would respond by faith to partner with him, preparing an ark, as it were, for the saving of his sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters that don't know him yet. And so for me, this morning, that that real challenge of, of Noah, his obedience, his patience, his commitment, his, his push to the end, a purpose of saving his family. And I want to say in, in, in this, this new covenant or this new day, the new era that we live in, Man, Christ wants to partner with us. He wants us to be like a Noah, to to build and to work and to have obedience and patience to work with him and and step out in faith, even if the world would jump the fence and tag all over us and, and, and pull us down. For the saving of his sons and daughters, he desires that no one would be lost. So God calls us to a life of obedience, working with him. And our vision statement that's on the wall at the door, we are saved to see salvation. We are blessed to be a blessing and we're one to do his work. Like Noah, let's choose to do that by faith. And so that's my message this morning. And I'm just going to invite the team to come back up and we're going to sing a final song. And um, just want to pray as, as we do that. Lord, we thank you, the life of Noah. And this morning we haven't pulled all the details apart. We haven't looked at A to B to C and, and, and looked at to the, the final completion. But Lord, I thank you for the life that Noah lived. Lord, I thank you for his obedience. Lord, his dedication and his, his perseverance through the midst of, of, of what was a wicked generation. But Lord, I thank you that in his obedience, Lord, he was granted rest. Lord, exactly what his name meant. He led his family into rest. And so, Lord, as we experienced your peace and your rest as we were worshiping and standing in your presence here this morning, 
Lord, I thank you for that rest and that peace that we felt. And so, Lord, I, I pray that, Lord, that in itself, Lord, would, would stir us on. Lord, by faith, we would, we would be encouraged and ignited, Lord, uh, called to action, called to obedience. A hundred and twenty years of a last chance for a wicked generation to turn from their ways. For us, we we don't know when Jesus is going to return. We don't know when our life's going to run short. We don't know what really tomorrow holds. The volatile financial market that we live in, the the craziness of governments and rulers and everything that's going on. But Lord, I thank you that we can trust in you. And Lord, when we respond by faith, Lord, to what you have commanded and laid out before us, Lord, I thank you for a man like Noah who, who what did he do? He responded just as you commanded. Lord, help us to respond just as this the scripture tells us. Lord, to go out to be your ambassadors. Lord, to partner with you. Lord, to, to build the church, to build the ark, to build, Lord, whatever it would be that would be able to bring your sons and daughters, Lord, into your rest. Lord, into your salvation. Lord, we weren't designed, we weren't created that we could just enjoy this, this grace and the salvation for ourselves. Lord, it's not a free pass. Lord, you desire that you would call us, Lord, into ministry. Maybe not necessarily working for a church or leading a small group or whatever, but just by faith responding, understanding and knowing that we're saved to see salvation. That, Lord, you've blessed us, Lord, to bless those around us. And, Lord, we've been one, victoriously one at the cross that we would do your work. So, Lord, be with us this week. Lord, as we reflect on Noah, Lord, let these words challenge us. How are we responding? With reverence, with fear, or are we responding with contempt? Lord, help us to reevaluate and wrestle in our lives. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing right now and what you've been doing, Lord, leading up to this point, Lord, in each and every life. And I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, your anointing, Lord, would be upon us all. That, Lord, you would help us. Lord, where, man, our relationships have slipped or... Lord, our commitment or our patience has, has boiled over or we've dropped the ball. Lord, I thank you. They need it. You don't require a perfect man or woman, but you require one, Lord, who will surrender, who will simply trust, who will do just as you command. And Lord, you will bless and pour your favor upon those who do. And so, Lord, our, our hope is in you the hope of salvation. Lord, give us faith. Lord, to fulfill all you have for us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's stand and sing together.